Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's seminar, Her Cost, What Prevents the Entry and Retention of Women in the Labor Market, a topic that Sri Lanka has been grappling with for decades. And that number you saw, 31% of female labor force participation, has been stagnant and has actually been declining for decades. And as a country that is proud of educating, education far before many others in the region, we have fared very poorly in enabling women to uh, contribute more to the Sri Lankan economy by enabling her to work and join the labor force. So today we are going to talk about general, a different topic to the general that we hear when it comes to labor force participation. We frequently talk about the benefits of female labor force participation. Today we are going to talk about the costs. Whether participating in the labor force is cost prohibitive for women in Sri Lanka. And that is a study we did at Verity Research and we are pleased to share the findings with you and to really discuss how we can really reduce these costs and get more women to join the labor force. So today we have with me a very eminent panel that is very well known to all of you. So I'm not going to introduce in detail each and every one of them, but I would like to invite them to jo join me at the podium. We have Sumini Sembalapitiya, who was one of the leading researchers uh, who actually conducted this research, who will be sharing the research findings. She's a senior research analyst in economics team at Verita Research. And we have Kasturi Wilson. All of us know her very well, and we see her frequently in media, at forums, in magazines. So Kasturi, please join us. She's a group CEO of Hemas Holdings PLC. And we have Sulochana Sigera, uh, current chairperson of Women in Management, who has been doing a lot of work uh, to empower women in Sri Lanka and Tusita, who is currently a board member and joint secretary of the Women's Chamber of Commerce and Industry in Sri Lanka. And lastly, we have Eran Vikramaratna, again, everyone uh, knows very well, a member of parliament in the opposition. Kindly join me. We are doing this uh, session today together with the Women's Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Now I would like to welcome the chairperson of the Women's Chamber of Commerce uh, to deliver the welcome remarks. Anoji De Silva, the chairperson of Women's Chamber of Commerce. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm going to make it very short because I'm sure you're really interested in the panel discussion, in, not in my welcome speech. Um, but just to say the Women's Chamber of Industry and Commerce, uh, we are very excited to collaborate with uh, the Verite team on this, and thank you for inviting us. Uh, because uh, our focus is also to ensure that the women contribute to the economy of Sri Lanka. Uh, I think we are very proud to say we have 98% uh, uh, literacy rate in this country, and uh, we use the literacy rate, uh, majority of that is, is also made up of women, because 60 to 80% of the university education is also consumed by women. Uh, but interestingly, the finance literacy rate of people in Sri Lanka, including both uh, males and females, is only 35%. Compared to a 98% uh, book literacy rate, the finance literacy is uh, 35, uh, which also shows we don't really check the cost. 
we only make use of facilities, we don't really uh, link the cost of doing something. So I think this study really reflects that. While we, uh, women always get uh, flack for saying we are not working, uh, we take up so much of resources, but only 36%. Uh, so probably it's also that they can't afford to get back to work because the cost of work uh, is too high. So that's something that was interesting to us. And we are also doing certain programs uh, at the chamber to help, uh, I think, one program, uh, which is very close to our hearts, is to uh, have dignity of labor of uh, the women who really help people like me to be at work, which is our um, domestic aides and the domestic caregivers, because at the moment, uh, their, their work is not considered an official job in this country. They have no facilities. Uh, they don't have a proper pension care. They don't have a minimum wage. So the minister is here, maybe, sorry, the former minister is here, so maybe something he can <laughs> take up as a policy drive. Uh, so the chamber is doing a program called Cyrilia, where we are trying to teach them the basic skills, and they also end up with a basic resume. Uh, reference scheme and also minimum uh, wage scale. So that that is also considered similar to maybe even the Filipino maids. It's considered a high skill job. Like in Filipino maids and even in US you have uh, the uh, aids. They are very highly paid. Uh, so that's, we are also help doing our different uh, Endeavor. So I think I always believe it's good to collaborate and uh, bring everyone's efforts together because we are all walking towards the same goal. Uh, so thank you again, Subhashini, for inviting our team and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arjun. Now I'd like to uh, request Sumini uh, to come and uh, present the findings of the research. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm so pleased to be able to speak with you today and share our research. Um, there will be three components to this presentation. One, where we'll set out the context to our research. Second, where we'll lay out some of our key findings. And finally, where we'll get into the meat um, of this presentation, where we'll talk through our recommendations for the private sector and beyond. Um, before I start out, I want to let you know that you can access our full report. Um, you can see the QR code up there. You can scan it through your um, phone. Um, and please do, if you ever get a chance, please do uh, read through our entire report. Starting off, um, it's quite well known that Sri Lanka has an abysmally low female labor force participation rate. In 2021, Sri Lanka had the 17th largest gender gap in labor force participation in the entire world. Um, as previously mentioned, just 31% of women in the labor force, women were in the labor force compared to 71% of men. And it's an issue that has very much persisted through and through time. Female labor force participation in Sri Lanka has stagnated over the last two decades. And if you look quite closely at the numbers, in the past five years, it's continued to decline. Um, and it's no, it will, it's certainly a point of concern, especially given Sri Lanka's current crisis, that female labor force participation is a key issue in Sri Lanka. Before I move any further, I do want to ask, why is this an important issue for us to address? And the simple answer to that is, it just makes a lot of sense for us to address it. Number one, it makes economic sense. When you look um, at a study done in 2018 by McKinsey, the study shows that Sri Lanka could add 14%. That's an estimated 20 billion US dollars to its annual GDP by 2025 if it improved female labor force participation. Of course, um, given time has passed, it is quite possible that the rupee term value may have changed, but the argument very much does still stand. When we boost women, we boost the economy as well. The second point I want to highlight is that Addressing female labor force participation just makes a lot of social sense. Numerous studies have time and time again pointed out that when women participate in the labor force, it is directly linked to better outcomes in household bargaining, 
personal autonomy, and decision making within and outside the home. Our research was motivated by a desire to analyze the problem from a different angle, one that has not been previously done at length. And we did this by looking at cost. Is engaging in the labor market cost prohibitive for urban women? And why cost is a useful tool to analyze um, female labor force participation, there's three reasons to it. One, that family and society is disproportionately reliant on women's unpaid household and care labor. Secondly, that women, when women take up employment, there is a subsequent increase in both personal and household costs. And finally, at a fundamental level, considering that the choice architecture and the implications involved for women taking up employment is very much different to that of men. The goal of our study was to understand the barriers that women face to entry and retention in Sri Lanka's labor market via estimating both monetary and non-monetary costs. For the purpose of saving time, I will not be going into the details of the methodology of the study, although I do welcome questions at a later time, but I do want to point out one thing. What makes our study unique is, as I previously mentioned, we tried to estimate both monetary and non-monetary costs. And this is important because non-monetary costs often tend to be both hidden and ignored. Um, if you look at the graph up on the screen, you can see that we considered, um, as previously mentioned, both monetary costs, which include direct job-related expenses, such as clothing, transport. Um, and I do want to mention one thing here. Even these very explicit monetary costs do tend to be quite gendered. For example, when women make decisions related to um, their place of employment, often access accessibility in terms of um, safe transportation, whether it's a public or private means, um, things like that are often considered as well. Um, and then we have household related expenses. This includes things like childcare, elder care, and domestic tasks such as cooking and cleaning. Um, moving on to the more interesting portion, which is how we estimated non-monetary costs, we considered three key um, components to this costing. One being social and emotional related costs. This includes things like the mental exhaustion due to double burden, um, separation from young children and family. Um, and then secondly, our second component was the implication on physical costs. And this includes the very real physical cost of the double burden as well. And finally, we consider the impact on personal development. And this includes the lackward upward mobility, which may be choices that may be compromised because um, of a woman's other responsibilities in um, the home um, alongside their employed uh, responsibilities at their workplace. The, before I move on to our key findings, I want to emphasize one thing, and that was that this study was high, uh, conducted in the latter part of 2021. And the costs that I'm about to detail may have changed in absolute rupee terms due to the Sri Lankan crisis. That said, the conclusions we draw from them remain true, even in a, even, perhaps even in a more profound way, because while costs have increased significantly over the past few years, incomes have not increased with the same elasticity. According to our findings, every 100 rupees that employed women in Sri Lanka earn, it costs them 160 rupees. Let's consider that for a moment. It costs more for women to engage in paid work than they earn. This steep cost might actually help explain why Sri Lanka's female labor force participation rate is so low. It's just not economically feasible. But it also begs an important question, why do women remain in the labor force then? Our research supports two hypotheses. One, that women do it out of financial necessity they simply can't afford to account for non-monetary costs. And secondly, that there is a hidden non-monetary benefit. This a word that came up a lot during our research was the, um, was the singular word nidahasa. While the direct translation of that word means freedom in English, um, it actually encapsulates something a lot more in terms of autonomy, um, agency, and the ability to make choices, have a life outside of being a mother and a wife um, as, a, as your own person in a certain sense um, that being employed gives you. What's also interesting is just how important non-monetary costs are. 
57% of all costs incurred by employed women was non-monetary. And that's not an insignificant number. If you look at the table over on the slide, what's really interesting is that the majority of this cost comes from social and emotional costs. That's 34%. And it's interesting because especially when women make choices regarding labor force participation, we often only consider the explicit cost involved. And that is going to be a mere 43% of your actual cost of being employed. Sri Lanka's issue with female labor force participation is not just with entry, but also with retention. Sri Lanka has a massive issue with a leaky pipeline where women often drop out of the labor force at key milestones, including at marriage and at childbirth. And this is particularly interesting given that the costs that previously employed women that had previously worked and then left the labor force incurred are so low. If you look at the um, graph over on the slide, the cost of working for previously employed women um, was about 14,000 rupees per month. And this is comparable to the fact that currently employed women incurred a total cost of about 41,000 rupees a month. That's a massive difference. And it really does beg the question then, why do these women not return to the labor force? Um, and the fact of the matter is that if women in this group do return to the labor force, they are very much going to be, um, they will be constrained in a significantly different way. And this is where we complicate this topic by looking at the way that gender norms are institutionalized within marriage. Um, and what was interesting with this cohort, especially with women that had been employed and then left the labor force, was that the decision to leave the labor force was often heavily influenced by spouses. And sort of taking that into consideration, really sort of the puzzle starts to make sense as to why women then don't return to the labor force. Because as of now, when they're out of the labor force, they perceive their cost um, of working as being very much lower if they were to actually return the non-monetary cost that they would incur, both in terms of the physical and emotional cost of the double burden, um, as well as other non-monetary costs would be in fact significantly higher. Another interesting thing that I want to point out from our research is how important of a factor childcare is in driving the high cost of labor force participation for women. Childcare in Sri Lanka is both unaffordable and unreliable. Two things um, that I would like to point out is how the unpaid labor family members, often again very much gendered with mothers and uh, grandparents rather, grandmothers, um, being the key enabling factor for a lot of women in Sri Lanka to be able to take part in the labor force. Something that came up quite a lot was the fact that if um, a particular um, woman did not have access to informal family support in that way, they were not willing um, to actually engage in the paid, in, uh, paid labor because it just was not worth that hassle because of the fact that formal childcare services were perceived as being both unreliable and were also seen as unaffordable. Uh, the monetary cost of doing a job for women was more than double when childcare needs needed to be outsourced. And this monetary cost actually exceeded um, women's median earnings, which really just puts into perspective the fact that childcare in Sri Lanka is not affordable for a large amount of women. Now we get perhaps um, into the most important part of this presentation. How does our research inform actual tangible change to improve female labor force participation? We have identified three key areas for private sector intervention. One, uh, to address the lack of affordable and reliable childcare. Secondly, to address the limited opportunities for women to return to work and address Sri Lanka's leaky pipeline of female labor force participation. And thirdly, to address the role of rigid gender and cultural norms, including the lack of spousal support. Our first recommendation aims to bridge the trust deficit by supporting and advocating for highly accredited childcare service providers. This includes advocating for government to introduce updated minimum standards and accreditations for the operation of facilities like daycare centers. And this can be done by the private sector organizations as well, where they have 
I would like to see an influential role um, by introducing their own voluntary standards and partnering with highly accredited childcare centers. Clearly, childcare is a very big piece of the puzzle as to why women remain out of the labor force and leave the labor force. And therefore, it's a crucial piece for us to both consider both as individuals and as also especially as parts of organizations that have the power to sort of influence the standards that childcare institutions and other providers are held to in Sri Lanka. A second recommendation aims to build public demand to implement the national policy on child daycare centers. It's little known, but in 2019, the Ministry of Women and Child Affairs actually included provision to include quality, child, quality and affordable childcare services in Sri Lanka. Um, despite the fact that it has been drafted, it has not been implemented, and certainly as organizations that have, um, it, we would certainly benefit us all if we could drive public demand um, to get this policy implemented. The third um, recommendation that I would like to highlight um, is for us to design and implement return to work programs that specifically target women returning to the labor force after a career break. I would like to point to one very successful example in Tata. Um, Tata India has a program called the Second Careers Inspiring Possibilities Program, which has successfully reintegrated over 10,000 women back into the labor force after a career break. Clearly, Sri Lanka has an issue with the leaky pipeline of female labor force participation. And often, there's very minimal opportunities for women to return to the labor force after a career break. Um, the motherhood penalty is something that we have probably all heard of. And th the value of programs such as um, Tata India Second Careers Program is the fact that it formalizes a sort of pathway back in into the labor force. And this is done by introducing sort of um, provisions like part-time working, working from home, flexible working hours, which in fact should sort of pave the way for us to normalize this in a more institutional sense as well. Um, certainly because um, it may, uh, to mainstreaming this idea of how labor is performed and how institutions function serve to better both the productivity um, and the incentives offered to labor force uh, to your employees. And finally, um, a final recommendation aims to introduce gender equitable workplace policies, um, a good example being paternity leave. I would like to take a moment at this time to acknowledge that many um, certain companies in Sri Lanka have taken that first step with introducing equal paternity leave or paternity leave policies um, at all. And it's certainly a good first step for us to acknowledge that um, to incentivize rather more involvement of men in care labor, um, and also just to um, both acknowledge and address the disproportionate amount of unpaid labor that is currently being done by women. Um, and there's been significant um, proof um, by studies worldwide that introducing such gender equitable workplace policies boosts the morale and productivity, not just of female employees, but also of male employees and the workforce as a whole. That's the end of my presentation. Again, I'd like to point you to our uh, research report. Please do scan the QR code um, and read our report in full. Um, I will take questions at a later time when we do a panel discussion, but that's, um, with that, I'd like to end. Thank you so much. Thank you, Samini. And I'm sure most of these problems and issues uh, all of you would have heard and dealt with in the past as well. But what is really important is uh, uh, that we acknowledge we have not made progress. Despite many studies, many uh, research, and many conferences, uh, sadly, we are making very poor progress in this area. And that is why it's really, one is it's important to continue to talk about it, and it's really important to see how all of us who care about uh, this topic and care about um, getting women back to work and in enhancing their contribution to the Sri Lankan economy and also empowering them, really how can we get together and make sure there is, there is uh, more progress in this area than before. So, so to this effect, we have uh, people in the panel who can actually influence the policy and uh, in their companies as well as in the country. And I would like to now turn to Tusita, who is heading an important organization 
uh, Women's cham uh, in Chamber of Industry and Commerce that has uh, that really um, has been working uh, in uh, this area for a long time to basically ask her what can be a few uh, basically few of the recommendations that we have uh, we have put on on record there to understand what are your views and what do you think can be done especially to bridge the trust deficit so free, uh, lack of affordability is only one part of the question, but even when people can afford finding quality, reliable childcare is not easy. So, so I would like to ask the Sita what can be done to bridge a trust deficit and also what has uh, Women's Chamber been doing in this area to support women? I, I think uh, Anoji touched on this as well. Uh, so we, I mean, one of the the key reasons why uh, we are unable to continue to work, uh, especially after childbirth, is simply because we don't have probably a good support system. I mean, some of us, some of us may be lucky, where you have your parents or um, in-laws who can take care of the children. But in the majority of the homes, especially the urban homes, which are like more nuclear families, it is very tough to uh, have that kind of support system. So they have to depend on, if at all, a system of trusting somebody else with your baby on childcare. Now, similarly, it's not just the childcare that is holding you back, especially now uh, with, with our demographics changing. The economically agile population has the burden of looking after the elderly parents as well. So childcare as well as elderly care becomes a huge responsibility for a, especially the working woman and, and the people who are economically agile. Uh, we have launched a program called Cerelia, which I know just touched briefly on it. It is like we know that Sri Lanka is sending a lot of females outside to work and uh, they go out and work as housekeepers. Um, but most of them actually work long hours. They don't get paid what they are promised when they leave. And majority of them actually don't progress with that kind of uh, work because they don't save, they send the money home, there are issues, they have, they have family issues because uh, the children are left unattended. So it's a lot of social issues around it as well. Uh, what we are saying, or what we feel can be done is, I mean, there is an equal opportunity for similar jobs in Sri Lanka. There are uh, ACC A, A plus households which can afford to pay similar salaries for qualified, competent care workers, housekeepers. Now, in Sri Lanka, we have this habit of uh, thinking of people who work in our house as maids or servants. No, we need to give them the dignity of labor, elevate their job to a housekeeper level. And of course, from their angle as well, most of them are not educated. So we need to have some training programs to ensure that they have the minimum qualifications uh, from an experience point of view, that they can handle the jobs that are required. This Cerelia program is doing exactly that. We are train taking them through training, uh, teach them how a housekeeper should operate in, the, in a house. And at the end of the course, they get a certificate. And for majority of them, this is the first time that they ever, because majority, most of them haven't even gone to school. So that's the only certificate that they hold. And they are very proud about it as well. We encourage them to prepare their own CV, we guide them. And when they pitch for the next job, obviously she, she can command a slightly higher salary. Now, if we have some people like that to help us, the work, some of us can continue to work. We don't have to uh, be like very stretched when it comes to balancing all our multiple roles. So you have somebody at home you can trust who will look take care of the house and maybe take care of the children uh, so that you can focus on your multiple duties at uh, office. And another program that we want to initiate is also maybe people don't want to come back to work full time after a child, childbirth or staying at home. So is there any possibility of getting them on part time work? Can we create like a part time database of all the professionals who have now gone away from work and maybe uh, make it available for companies to access so then they want like short term or project based part time uh, work for uh, the companies to to support their system. So these kind of initiatives will help 
the females to get back to work without being too burdened about or guilty, feeling guilty about what is not being done at home. Thank you, Tusita. I think what is really important to understand is professionalizing the care service enables more women to get to work because care services provide a lot of employment opportunities, but dignity of labor and better minim labor standards and minimum pay, uh, better pay is very important uh, to really uh, develop the care services sector as a professional sector that is respected and regarded. Uh, so at the same time, I would like to turn to Kasturi, who is uh, heading a leading conglomerate uh, in the country, because uh, what uh, and taking on from where Tusita left, one of the uh, World over, it's recognized that a lot of female professionals have to uh, take a break in their mid-career. So as a result, out there, there is a large pool of untapped uh, mid-level uh, mid professionals. That is really a valuable resource for many companies. And, and to quote a survey that was done in America, 91% of American workers had said that mothers bring unique skills like communication, multitasking, and remaining calm under fire to leadership than, uh, that others don't. And, and, that, and as a result, employers do welcome moms and not shut them out because they do become better administrators after being trained by their children. Uh, so, so what is really important is to understand how is Sri Lankan corporates uh, thinking about tapping into this, uh, this uh, pool of uh, women uh, who are talented and skilled but constrained to do maybe a full-time job. Are uh, there return to work policies? Are the corporates thinking progressively? What are the challenges that you see Sri Lanka is facing? Thanks, Subhashini. So you're right. I think the biggest dropout is uh, mid-career or the fact that when women become moms, it can be at the beginning of your career or even in the mid-career. And um, the choices are purely based on a few things. One is that they fundamentally, emotionally, they feel that they have to be this full-time mom to be a good mom. That was our time, and I still hear a lot of that voice coming through. Um, secondly, is that yes, the care caretaker to look after the babies and kids, and now it gets more difficult because the parents are aging. And thirdly, I think it's also the, the un, un, non-financial cost is you don't have a spouse, or culturally men are not supposed to be part of this caregiving program of a family, right? Or, or inclusive parenting is not really encouraged. And um, so when you talk about bringing the, the, the woman, the career lady ba woman back into the uh, fold, we need to address some of these issues. It's easy to say um, we'll give flexi time, flexible options, uh, which is one option, which we allow them to take extended leave, flexi leave, and when you, when you give these tools, honestly, I know, I know in the last two years, I have people who directly report to me who became young moms. They didn't take one day of maternity leave. I mean, she was like doing some work before she went to give birth. And third day after giving birth, she was online doing some work. But the kids are about one and a half years. They're still working from home most of the time. I don't even question because the work is done. So you today, thanks to COVID, that part is sorted, right? The commitment is there. But where they struggle is letting go and, and having that pair of the spouse's support. Spouses will say, I encourage my partner's uh, wife's job. But will they take that part of looking after the baby for half a day when the wife has to come into work for a meeting? That is a, that, it's a mindset change. So I, from, from what I see is there are tools we could do, give in terms of... Uh, um, contract time, work, part-time work, flexi time, all that is given. I think there are companies who give child care programs and facilities, which comes with a lot of compliance, but that's there. But until we crack the practices and policies at a workplace, I was lucky because those days, 20 years ago, there was a practice that women 
had it unequal at home, so it was unequal at office. We could come in late, we could go early. It was like a, but the outcomes were there. So till we cracked that, and, and that's a culture, they are the men and women have to be part of it. Because I think the greatest challenge a young mom faces is feeling that she's left behind when she comes into work, she has lost in this race, there are others waiting to see her f left behind in the career progression. All this support we as colleagues don't give. If we can crack that and move forward, I think um, we can do that. And, and a lot about the men, because we give paternity leave. I mean, we introduced paternity leave, I think, about five years ago, at three or four weeks. And first reaction I had across the room, I think we were part of a management team, we decided, the men said, now why are you just, you know, stirring up a hornet's nest? Why do we need four weeks? You know, we'll have to do a lot of work. It was said in humor, but I don't think many people, gentlemen who were fathers took up on that leave. So we need that in, in thing coming through. But I must say on the positive side, the young gen now I see, the young men are taking an active role in in um, in promoting this. I mean, th those are things which we can do. And when I saw your suggestions, I think the point two and three of of uh, finding spousal support and stuff, it's it's important to um, to advocate that. So I think there are a lot to be done, but more softer cultural practice, more than policy. I'm av I'm avoiding the word policy because that's kind of a rule versus a practice and culture to help people, women succeed. Thank you, Kasturi. So that's a, that's a challenge that needs to be overcome maybe through education, better education and awareness creation and training to really understand, uh, you know, really challenge this definition of gendered roles at home that certain roles are to be done by women and certain roles are to be done by men. So, so that brings me to uh, Sulochana, who has also been um, constantly uh, questioning the, the, the influence of the spouse in the decision of, uh, of a wife or a mother to work. Uh, Sulochana, would you like to share your insights and thoughts and what can be done about it? And also, Sulochana has been frequently talking about the SME sector, which is a very, very important sector that provides large uh, number of employment opportunities for women. How is SME sector uh, looking at and how can they be encouraged uh, to really uh, adopt uh, women-friendly working environments? Sulochana, over to you. Uh. Coming back to before the SMEs, as uh, she said, when uh, Tata did that project, I was able to go and study the project, and I brought them back uh, to Sri Lanka. And she spoke, and also Iran was there as a speaker. And many of the gentlemen rejected that uh, six years ago, saying that it will not be uh, suitable for Sri Lanka at that time. And many of the gentlemen who were there was bankers, right? So returning policy of returning, getting um, women back to the workplace after the maternity. And this is a good session, but I would prefer if actually the education sector also be in touch. Because I'm, at the moment, I'm currently doing a huge program for all the authorities in the education sector on gender equality and gender equity. They have a different aspect of that. And a lot of vice chancellors, sad to say, they said, women should not be paid equally because they are taking three months leave. So this is the mindset that goes to the young generation. And suddenly he said, the plantation sector, why the two uh, different payment is, I'll tell it in English, uh, but he said it in a very good single language. Um, he said, women, pluck the tea, uh, women are tea pluckers, but the men cut the trees. Gehanun te dalu nalanelanwa vitarai pirimin amaruen gas kapanwa. Therefore, you have to have a two different uh, pay schemes. So, this was said by a professor, right? So, coming on to the SME sector, as the IFC report clearly says, 75% of Sri Lankan businesses are uh, SMEs, 45% employment are given by SMEs. 25% of SMEs are run by women. We are talking about uh, giving uh, daycare centers and we are talking about paternity leave. But SMEs, they can't afford it. So what is the mechanism that we are going to talk? We are only talking about big companies which can afford. 
but SMEs, how come, how come they can afford it? Why not share the responsibilities? And uh, 2019, as she's rightly said, is, yes, we got a policy, but government implemented the child care facility in 2017 in all division and secretariat. In Colombo itself, there are seven daycare centers run by the government, but hardly people know and hardly people use it. I have visited all these seven, and with the COVID, they did stop it. Only two or three is functioning. If that can be taken and re, um, remanage it and make it a different, I think a lot of women can come back to the uh, employment again. I, what I feel is many of the organization, even the skill development ministry is doing, getting women into industries that not not uh, uh, female friendly. Some of the industries you do hardly get uh, girls coming back. But what they are trying is something else. But each and every organization is doing uh, things that they think it goes with the uh, improving or increasing the women uh, in employment. I think every year, we, if the country or the policymakers can give objective, this is what we have to do. Then all organizations can do it in a one way rather than we picking up, isolate one thing and work it, and when another person comes, they change it accordingly. The continuous of these things are not there. And that has happened to Sri Lanka, and SMEs are the people who are paying from it because a lot of SMEs complain that we speak about, because one of the things is, you, uh, what they said to me is, you recognize companies already who have systems. Women who are comfortable to coming to that system and working and getting to promoted is very easy when there is a system. But SMEs, we hardly get government or the authorities or non-government investing us. So I think it's high time that we look at SMEs as not as just a cost. They are the people who run the country economy. And there has to be, I would say, a contribution from SMEs, big companies, and the government, if we really want to make a change. Thank you, Saloch. And I think we need a change in mindset to uh, consider uh, giving a mother an opportunity to return to work is not charity, that it is value. And companies should look at it as value. And also, uh, I would like to turn to, the, uh, to Iran just to discuss the responsibility of the society. So I was reading uh, a statement made in Singapore uh, Child Care Authority that they do have in, uh, in, they have a very extensive uh, child care facility. They even give tax rebates to mothers who work. Uh, and even grandparents get, uh, uh, get paid by the government, especially grandparents who take care of the children. So there is enormous amount of support given. But in every place that I see, it basically how they consider it as that it is enormously beneficial and valuable to the country, to the economy, and to the society to do so. They're not looking it, uh, looking at it as some charity or something that you need to do because uh, to support women. But by supporting women, that they're supporting the country, they're supporting the economy, and they're supporting society. So I would like to turn to uh, turn to um, uh, uh, Iran to ask from a policy perspective, where do you think that the government can step in, both in terms of education, uh, to change the, the gender norms and the gender attitudes, because you can do so from early stages and as, as part of education, and also in, in supporting uh, to address some of these uh, constraints that women face in terms of accessing affordable and good quality childcare. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I think the subject could be uh, addressed in two ways, as you suggested. One is you can look at it from a justice point of view. And I strongly believe in that, basically on the principle of equality. But uh, Sumini, yeah, in her study, the first slide she put uh, was a really revealing. She said that the McKinsey study showed that in a short run, that Sri Lanka's GDP could be up by 14%, which was about $20 billion. So if you leave the equality and justice issue aside and just look at it in just from an economics point of view, uh, I, I like to look at the study in detail. Uh, I, I think it's very clear, just from an economics point of view, to have such low labor force participation 
and uh, when we have realized also education levels among the uh, woman or the or the or the, or the girl uh, student and the boy student education levels o levels a levels university professionals and all how it has rapidly gone up in the last uh, two decades clearly we are from an economics point of view absolute losers by not really uh, using this uh, opportunity so uh, the question of education and changing attitudes is very complicated but then there is the the second part of the question is more about policy uh, i'm all for uh, changing attitudes <laughs> and working at it uh, don't look at the 225 for that please <laughs> right i think everybody in society is responsible for that uh, uh, but on the policy side which is more the responsibility of parliament right i think there is much that can be done uh, you referred to a, a, a paper in 216 uh, and brought up into 19 and uh, that was referring to uh, things like child care because your study showed that that's one of the largest inhibitors of actually people going to work and your study also showed that when it came to elder care uh, uh, the 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 woman was willing to hire the services and certainly not willing to hire the services for child care for various different different reasons because of the quality and so forth and then in the study i also saw that you had the work based thing which kasturi uh <coughs> referred to uh, and then you had the home based and then you had uh, school based and i thought that was very interesting your school based idea and, and the reason i immediately connected with it is i went to school as a child and often either my parents forgot to pick me up or they just couldn't pick me up and i was often picked up at 5 o'clock 6 o'clock in the evening Uh, fortunately i didn't get abused that was the risk side of it but uh, the positive side of it is i was forced to just mingle i was forced to play i became a sports person so i saw in the study you had two work based ideas one was the work based child care and a work based work based activity center i i had never thought about it i think it's a brilliant idea because if we look at it like this parents are confident about sending their children to school but not to some child care center so i think there is a starting point to start with you see that something about the environment is taken care of and probably some idea of regulation or whatever so uh, i think that's that's not in our paper but i think something that could be included so government can come in two ways one way it could come in is building on the maternity leave extending it to parental or paternity leave uh, mangala samaravir as finance minister actually proposed that 50% of the cost of maternity leave be borne by government so that the private sector cost of employment goes down so that they will be encouraged to employ more people i think we should certainly go down that path because that will be one way the other thing that we um, uh, should look at is Uh, particularly coming to work based you know where we can give you know we give access to tax exemptions of various various things but if you want to really get female workforce labor up maybe favor companies in some way and that could be looked at in detail who are actually providing the facilities and encouraging women to actually come and participate in the labor force i don't know enough about the tata case which i'll have to learn from the ladies here but i think from at a policy point of view certainly that's also something that needs to be looked at thank you very much now i would like to open uh, the, for question, uh, questions from the floor is there anyone who would like to ask any questions from any one of the panelists please is there a mic uh, thank you i think this is the first time we've been hearing about the costs um uh, monetary and non monetary so thank you for doing this research in a very unusual um, area my question is um it's 100 uh, to earn 100 we have to spend 160 in sri lanka have you done any comparisons 
among other countries, South Asia and in the world? Have they done research and where do we stand? Sumini, would you like to take that question? Sure. Um, so the nature of our study is actually quite unique in the sense that I don't think this methodology in itself has been really implemented elsewhere. Um, I do think comparatively, regionally, we stand on par with our South Asian peer in terms of female labor force participation rates, although in costs, I can't comment on it because I don't think a study of this nature, particularly looking at um, how cost factors and trying to do sort of our methodology where we're trying to quantify that cost has been done, although it would be interesting um, and perhaps an area that we in the future do some research on ourselves. Yeah, I think that is exactly why the paper done by Sumini and the others was uh, awarded research paper of the year by University of Carolina because they also found that it was a very unique methodology and a unique approach to the problem of female labor force participation. Uh, any other questions? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, super interesting um, findings and very relevant certainly for the work that we're doing at the International Finance Corporation with the private sector. Um, I'd be interested to know whether in your study you were able to also disaggregate whether the costs changed by, for example, women who were working in SMEs versus women who were working in corporates um, and also whether you saw a difference in those costs uh, or whether you had data to do this, of um, women who are working in an, in an environment where some of those support services are provided. For example, if there is an employer-provided childcare, if there are policies and practices in place, were you able to get into any of that, I guess, nuance to see how the costs might change? So, Mini, go ahead. Sure. Um, I, so our study, again, was a very focused study where uh, it was very much focused on urban women and we did not disaggregate it by, by the area um, in which they were working, whether it was corporates, SME. What we, what we did do was disaggregate it by women who were employed at the time, women who had been previously employed, and women that had never been um, employed. Um, and that proved to be quite an interesting analysis, although that it, in the sense of like women that had worked and then left the labor force, their reflections were quite interesting. Um, but we didn't, unfortunately, in this occasion, get to sort of disaggregate it by um, uh, sort of the area in which they were working, whether it was SMEs, corporates. Um, again, a very interesting area for future research. This was a very preliminary and, again, a very unique, novel way of doing it. So this was, I hope, set the precedent for us to continue in this line of work um, in the future. I think we were largely constrained by the sample size to go for disaggregation. So it was only 660 women. So it didn't allow us to go for a disaggregated analysis with sufficient confidence where we can say what would happen. But like Sumini said, um, yeah, this was a preliminary study, but that showed enormous value and that, that can be expanded uh, to understand more the issues. Thank you. Uh, first, let me congratulate uh, the research team because it was a really fascinating study. I mean, I have, I think, read through the report, but not in, in depth. So I didn't get the, I didn't appreciate the richness of the research. But as you said, it's, it's a very unique approach. And I think uh, it lends itself to, uh, as you just said in your last response, uh, various offshoots, uh, you know, in terms of research. For example, if it was disaggregated in terms of where the women worked uh, or what types of employment they were in, and also in terms of the class differentiation within the urban cohort, perhaps we would have got a much more nuanced, uh, you know, findings in terms of the actual push and pull factors in terms of female labor force participation. Having said that, I would also like to bring a slightly different uh, uh, perspective in that we tend to focus on the fact that uh, female labor force participation is 31%, but we, we, I think we always need to remember that we are talking of the formal labor force, whereas there are almost 70% women in the informal sector and primarily in the care economy. And I don't think we have done sufficient research on the value, the economic value of the care economy in Sri Lanka, which underpins 
the formal economy, right? And and provides the impetus and the and the possibility for the formal economy to function, right? That work is completely ignored, is under is not just undervalued, it's not valued. And the value of that contribution to the formal economy is not seen. So I think uh, this study, I think, and the approach you have taken, really, uh, I think it's a starting point. And the other question is, we must ask ourselves, why is it that we always assume that women must enter the formal labor force? Right? Because without the informal economy, without the care economy, the formal labor force does not function. And here we are trying to push more and more women into the formal labor force without sufficient uh, change in numerous other factors, quite apart from childcare services or even transport services, as you mentioned in your report. Uh, I think one of the inhibiting factors for female labor force participation in the formal uh, labor force is also uh, you know, sexual harassment in public transport. You know, and, and reports have shown that. But there are other dimensions, other inhibiting factors. For example, the transport system itself, the urban environment, you know, which is not female friendly, the work environment, the structure and nature of work, which is not female friendly. And I think these dimensions need to be factored also into why women do not participate in the quote-unquote formal labor force. So thank you very much again for your research and your findings. Thank you very much. There are definitely numerous challenges that women face uh, that goes beyond what we've identified as well. But what's really important is that brings us uh, to two things. One is uh, when we are talking about labor force participation, we do talk about whether it's formal or informal. What is really important is their ability to participate in paid labor. Uh, as an important part uh, because that really brings with it many numerous advantages, not just for the woman, but for the society as well. So, so, so from that perspective, I think it's really important for us to focus on the care economy also as, a, as an opportunity for, for women to get into paid, lab uh, paid labor. And, and by bringing the, by upskilling them and, and enhancing the dignity of the profession. So, Bhashini, can I just say one thing? We still are saying the care, it's a woman's role to bring up the kid. Why can't it be parental policies? I'm trying to encourage, this will never work until men say they are going to support in the upbringing of the kid. And, and a corporate has to understand that fully. But having said that, I think the younger generation, uh, the next generation, is actually willingly participating in uh, in bringing. So up that's why I said the policy should be parent. The yes, narrative should change exactly. so that you allow this younger generation to lead with. It. Yeah, they, and uh, as I think some companies have already kind of taken steps, so it should be more progressive. But maybe that is where maybe we've done something right with our education policy or awareness policy so that our younger generation thinks differently from our generation, which also shows that maybe the education policy, there are opportunities uh, for the government to really, when you're developing curriculum, to really consider how can you really uh, bring, uh, at the moment, sometimes what a lot of studies show is the school, ed the education system actually reinforces the gender norms. But creating an education system that encourages people to challenge the, the existing gender norms would have been uh, very interesting. Uh, uh, and also, I just wanted to uh, just give a give a number from the from a manpower research group, of course, that is done this research in USA. But where corporates are increasingly seeing return to work programs and uh, women friendly working environment as imperative for them going forward, it's not just for women because this research finds 57 percent of male and 74 percent of female millennials anticipate taking a break. Uh, taking a career break for childcare, elder care, and to support the uh, and to support partner in a job. So for corporates, it will be important, and uh, for them to rethink even they are hiring the younger generation. These are important policies to to bring back uh, uh, to to tap into talent. Uh, Iran, you wanted to say something. 
No, no, I, I, I just want to comment that uh, you're talking of the younger generation and when that comment was made, uh, just judging by my own experience, I think there is some truth in it. But I would caution you that we shouldn't generalize. Uh, that may be true of certain segments in our population. So that's the caution I would throw. Definitely. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Before we move on, I would just like to acknowledge our colleague, Professor Dilani Gunavardhana's research that is currently ongoing um, in mapping the care economy of Sri Lanka. Um, a certainly a very important next step in recognizing both um, this very much hidden component that really enables and enables the paid and formal um, labor force to function. And um, it's currently ongoing, this research, so hopefully that's something we um, look forward to sharing and discussing as well. Are there any additional questions, comments from the audience? We actually have a question from um, an online participant. Um, the question is, did the study include any research on workplace abuse or harassment? And if this was a reason for women leaving the workforce and being reluctant to come back? Um, I will answer it myself. So one thing we did look at is the physical toll and both the emotional toll, and that included explicit um, accommodations for um, harassment, any sort of physical or emotional harm in itself. Um, it, as I said before, our research was quite uh, focused in our sample size, therefore in our qualitative component, it did not come up um, as a reason as to why women were maybe exiting the labor force or reluctant to come back. But uh, the quantitative por portion of our research um, where we calculated sort of the cost that perhaps these certain, even if it was a certain microaggression that women experience in the workplace, that kind of thing um, was certainly accounted for in our research. And we certainly accommodated for um, how these harassment, abuse, um, and perhaps other forms of harm that women experience in the workplace might play out into the costing um, and the quantification of the costs that women um, experience to take part in the labor force. Can I make a comment? We're not about the harassment when the young generation, because I work with the young generation a lot now. Let me tell, uh, as his, uh, Iran said, we can't generalize it, but being, um, there's nothing called gender equality or gender equity it's nothing to do with being independent, not getting married. So there is an issue that young girls being encouraged, being independent means that you don't need to get married and don't need to have kids. So this is one of the most trending thing with the youth. And also, if uh, we did a research with the 300 uh, uh, youth, many of them, 75% of them has said, click, that when I get married, I want my wife to stay at home, right? So these are not just the urban, these are from the all over the country, all districts. So the reason they have given is, I think, there's two reasons they have given. One is the girls getting more independent and more educated, and the ego of the boys and the power of the boys goes up. Because we were not in Colombo Station, you go and live, because that is the male ego. Second one is, while the men think that, the, uh, as the research says, the women think they get more freedom. The women, uh, the men has an um, insecurity that they will start an affair while they are in work. So that is one of the things that they have ticked in that survey, because we started a mentoring and we put this question. And this is the answers we got it. And it was so shocking, and these are, uh, uh, generation below 30 years, above 16 years. So these are the things that we have to look at. We have to speak about not equality, actually we have to speak about equity. There's nothing without equity. When the equity is there, equality comes. So unfortunately we have mixed this. We first speak about equality, then come to equity. And uh, when you say the harassment, we should not generalize this harassment about women in workplace. Harassment has no gender. The more you put the women in front, what happens is it's become a women issue. And then when it come become a women issue, it's automatically the men rejects it. So we have to understand we need men and women to work together if you want women to participate in the economy. It's, we can't reject men and say the women we need it. 
So there has to be a partnership. If we don't have a partnership, as Kasturi said, it's not the mother's duty, it's a parenting. It's a mother and father. Same way harassment is for both gender. Because the men also get harassed. But when they go, we laughed at them, be a man. I know many cases because I sit as an independent, um, uh, some of the independent inquiries, and I know how they treat it. So we have to do not generalize harassment and say it's a women issue. It's a corporate ethic issue. Every employee should have a respect. I think that has to be in whatever we speak, that has to be in that. I think adding on to that question, answering that question, uh, the Women's Chamber just did a huge survey on gender-based violence and harassment on women. We are about to publicize it. It is very clear that it exists. So the awareness levels, that it, the rights of the woman is not, uh, I mean, they don't even know that they have rights. And in certain organizations, obviously, like the first thing that you would do is actually go to the HR. They don't have any faith in the system. They don't believe that justice will be done. And they also, some of them also have stated that uh, they speak to the, the perpetrator and ask him to change the behavior. Now, that's not going to happen. So majority of the time, what happens is they leave the, leave the workplace. So it does happen. Yes, definitely the sexual harassment is something we can't shy away from. But also it is a very important thing for the corporate sector to consider having proper sexual, sexual harassment prevention policies in their organization and having proper complaining procedures. Um, I would like to just ask, um, um, Kasuri, do you see Sri Lankan corporate sector embracing this kind of uh, policies or are they shying away from them? So when you use the word corporate, I think you'll be talking about some about eight to 10 maximum corporates who would adopt this. But then you have SMEs and, and the, um, the other smaller corp corporates or family business which have grown. And those which are entrepreneur led, they struggle to adapt it because the culture of that or the mindset on the value system is based on the entrepreneurs. And um, so you, you would have the bigger corporates, which employ quite a significant um, lot of uh, citizens, are embracing this. Because I think you're f one thing they're forced to, but now they understand for them, it makes economic benefit to make sure that they acknowledge the rights, they acknowledge that the environment has to be conducive for people to perform. If not, your bottom line is not going to be there. It doesn't make sense if we ignore it. Any other questions, comments? They cannot afford to ignore it, but they are ignoring it now. Why don't we put it in the labor law? Sexual harassment in the workplace as a part of termination. It's not. It's in 345 of the penal code. It's not in the labor law regime. We have 56 labor laws, but nothing covers sexual harassment. We can sort of by some side wind, get it in as constructive termination. And there are no uh, sort of uh, mechanisms, really strong mechanisms to address the issue if and when it happens in the workplace. Because it's also stigmatizing. And that comes from uh, schools. You see where women are chattels and uh, they should be confined to the house. And uh, you'll never give a Santa Claus gift of a tea set to a boy, <laughs> would you? <laughs> right? The teachers would object to that, in fact. So all these stereotyping comes right from babyhood. And then you come into your workplace and you normalize it. And there is no law even to really address the issue. So my question is, even if you have a policy, we do have policies, right? Forget it law, forget law. Within that environment, if somebody needs, is this policy is a deterrent to do something uh, which is not accepted. However, I think what you said that this whole eco, I'm not talking about the urban students, I'm talking about the non-urban, the school system and the villages and how they are brought up to 
uh, like you say, the, how a girl is treated, and the girl thinks it's okay to be treated. And you come into this. So it's the lot of ambiguity when you have, I've seen some of these cases, it's because they don't know what their rights are. You tell them, and it's a lot of, it's, it's like, for me, it took a long time to, to accept in my head it was okay, you're not a bad mother because you're not a full-time mother. It's a mindset thing. So it takes a long time for these women to understand what their rights are to ex and to understand how they should respond because these are the rights. So it's not easy. I'm not sure whether the law would sort it out because when you put it in, in law, eventually they look at the circumstances and the, how it has transpired, whether that would be just whether it would work or not. We have so many other laws, forget this, and it's blatantly broken. <laughs> whether this would sort the issue, I don't know. But for me, I think law is a starting point. At least it's a recognition of our rights, right? So place it in the law. Maybe like 100 other laws, it does not get implemented, right? But it might, just might. And we have two cases that, uh, what is that, uh, that teacher's case. And then we have the Katabdin case also. Right. Basically, they were, okay, sexual bribery, but it happened as sexual harassment in the workplace. And we brought it under another sort of uh, um, area of the law. So there are ways and means of, you know, innovatively trying to push it. But uh, it's just food for thought. I'm placing it on the table. It's not really directly related because uh, I don't think you got the cost of sexual harassment and all that into this study. As you said, it might be the next step. But since we are talking big about ILO 190, and we are trying to ratify it, and we have had discussions even in parliament, and with the honorable minister, and the state ministers, and all of them, we better go down that road a little faster. Thank you. I also believe that it is definitely, a, um, the, the challenges are enormous, but maybe what is important with the large corporates is in everything we talk about role models, that we need to start somewhere and we ha must have something, somebody to look up to and somebody to demonstrate, hey, we started a return to work policy and it is paying us and our company is benefiting from that and it makes economic sense and it has corporate value. And I guess that is the kind of messaging and signaling companies like Tata. I also read how Amazon, I mean, yes, it is a one of a kind company that SMEs can never aspire to be and do the same thing. But when Amazon says, I'm going to start a thousand return to work, uh, women return to work program and have a dedicated team to retrain women because after a career break, they may be out of touch. And, and, and when they say, actually, we are doing this because there is enormous corporate value. It is not a CSR program. And that is what would uh, maybe create inspiration. Maybe that is why we are looking for the corporate sector and the private sector to lead the way and tell everybody this can be done. And that makes economic sense. Are there any questions? We actually have uh, our executive director, Nishan, joining us virtually. And he'd like to say a few words. Hi, guys. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can, Nishan. Go ahead. Okay, so I just wanted to come in on a, because there's an echo coming to you. I, so I'm speaking now and I can't hear you. I, I, but I wanted to come in on this question about the different dimensions um, along which we could have analyzed uh, the costs for women. So I, I heard a question being asked saying there are various stratas of society, various types of prob women and problems and geographies, ethnicities. Um, I think the limitation here is really the size of the sample uh, and the scope of the research. So if you can talk to you know, several thousand women over the whole country, uh, then yes, we can answer those questions with adequate statistical clarity. Uh, but I think the reason not to attempt that is that would take a much, much bigger and a far more expensive study to try and do that, right? Cutting up a small sample in a geographically uh, specific uh, sort of area won't give us analytical value in trying to unpack those questions. So really, we had to make a choice depending on the resources available. Uh, and that's why the study is contained in that direction. And the 
second thing, Subhashini, I wanted to suggest was the focus of the value of the study. I think, you know, of course, there are lots of issues with regard to women uh, participating in the labor force. Um, and I think today's session is not about discussing everything that, that we can discuss because that often happens at events. But to ask what is the value of this particular understanding that we have gotten from the research we did and how can that understanding be operationalized uh, into solutions. So one way in which you know, Subhashini and others have talked to me about this is to understand, once you understand the nature of costs, what are the policy actions government can take to reduce those costs? So I think it would be great to think more that understanding these costs and the relative costs of non-material costs, psychological costs, suggest that there can be policy or sometimes there can be actually monetary transfers to overcome those costs. Uh, so we know that, you know, in some countries, uh, women who go to work uh, and or when both parents go to work, there is a significant allocation by the state to subsidize uh, childcare. Uh, but also I think other things that were discussed were how do you actually have childcare that reduce the psychological cost of going to work. So having identified these costs, I think it's of real value to focus on the research itself and say, how do these specific costs, what strategies do we have to reduce them? So those are my simple thoughts. Sorry that I can't be there in person. Uh, just to say thank you so much for the questions as well. Thank you, Nishan. Is there anyone who would like to raise any more questions? Are there any questions from the virtual audience, Sumini? Not at the moment, but one more thing that I would like to add, sorry, going back and forth uh, to your question, was that Veite, actually, our legal team has done um, some work on pushing for a civil law on, against sexual harassment. Um, and that's it's something that needs to be taken up again now by policymakers. But it's certainly an important, <laughs> it's certainly an important thing. Come on, maybe I make a comment. Uh, so often you hear about sexual harassment in the workplace. And the other thing you hear, and there are studies on transport, you see sexual harassment. Uh, so, uh, as I said, childcare is one thing, and where governments can come in uh, from the facilities, because I think the studies have shown that the facilities itself are atrocious. And then you have the childcare person and uh, not being qualified, not having a qualification, the recognition. Again, government can play a role. Then in terms of uh, the cost of uh, leave, the government can play a role. Uh, but I think transport, uh, without getting into the debate of uh, the choice of a person, whether they're working in the informal sector or the formal sector, uh, they have the choice. But transport anyway applies to all of them. And therefore, transport needs to be uh, very uh, safe. And uh, you know, one of the things that uh, d happened during the period I was in the finance ministry was that we had got this grant, which we were about to, we had negotiated and we were to, about to use it, called the MCC grant. And a portion of that, we had put it completely on transport. And the reason we put it on transport, public transport, was because we wanted to make it safer. So it was designed like that, with uh, you know, so it be controlled electronically. It can be monitored, so we can get a sense of nobody is going to touch me. You know, I'm in this compartment, or I'm in this uh, bus, or whatever. Now, uh, something very unfortunate, and before Subhashini hits hits me with it, I thought I might say it, is that a lot of these things have become an outcome of studies that have been funded by outside organizations, including the paper I think we did earlier in 2016 or whatever. Uh, this MCC thing was also like that. And then what happens is, if that goes away, and that went away for political reasons, as everybody in the country knows, uh, then the whole uh, effort has been abandoned. And uh, nobody is talking about safety and public transport and things like that. And uh, actually, uh, one huge policy mistake we have made, not now for decades, is the emphasis has been on uh, uh, private transport rather than on public transport. It's a huge policy mistake. 
but also then within the within that the safety so that we can increase the number of females participating in the labor force because that definitely is a factor that increases cost of women working uh, both emotionally and financially because they are forced to find private uh, private vehicles instead of going in a bus they will uh, they prefer to go in a tri show simply because of the safety reasons and also lack of availability for private sector especially when you are leaving uh, if you had to leave office at night uh, so so i think very important areas for the government to address but for so long we've invested in uh, fancy roads uh, which is important but unfortunately not invested in public transport uh, we do hope as a member of the opposition that uh, even if you're not in power you can definitely champion these policies and that you would do so uh, any other comments? so i have one comment which i think uh I only realized after reading her research and listening to her is the, the cost of the non-financial stuff. And I, I could totally relate to it. Um, and you carry this burden of the, the choices you make, the choices you make of not being there for your child when he needs you. Um, and the burden you carry because society says this, the mother is working all the time, so the children are neglected. They wouldn't know, it's an external frame, but you carry that cost. I've been one of those who have been, my, one of my sons is, was quite naughty in school and the tagline when they were all, there were four kids caught for something or the other. And the cost that this mother is working and is a single mom, so this child is, this is a repercussion of that. Versus then I said, what about the other four? Oh, no, no, they're okay, they're just naughty kids. So you're labeled this way. And that's a, that's a, and you walk out of that room heavy hearted thinking, am I doing something wrong? Why is this tag on me? Am I, you know, that, that cost you cannot, so you can bring the narrative that you make it okay for a woman to work and be a mom so that you ease that burden of the cost and the cost comes down. Um, the other one is of course the choice of, uh, you, you slow career progression because you choose to stay away and that's real. So. How do you make sure that you don't slow? How do you support women to succeed? But I think your, your research actually brought, down, brought out an element none of us talk about. And, and that's the hidden element we all carry as a cost. Let me add to Kasri because that is something I agree. I left my job because I became a single mother. The day I got um, my certificate of the divorce, I gave my resignation. Because that was the day uh, I, my kids wanted me and also the school, unfortunately during my this thing, my son's principal was there in the court. So that affected him so much that I had to leave my job. That's how I started Women in Management because I, 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 was, I didn't have an option. I have to leave my job and my son went through a lot of trauma. That's how I got into child psychology to help him up. As uh, the research went in, she explained to me on that day on Zoom, the psychological cost and all that, it really, it, you feel it when you have left something and we, when you were carry, uh, to date I carry that burden, I carry it. And sometimes when my kids do something wrong, I feel what will be the uh, repercussions. And when they are small, when they are teenagers, when they got Friendly with her, when they have crushes, I still remember one lady came home and told me, because you're single, your uh, children are not getting love, maybe they are uh, getting love from, looking for love from outside. That was one of the hardest things. But the emotion of this, it's not only for single mom, I'm telling. All the women sometimes, the priest, how many uh, religious priests blame on the women who are working? I do not know why they think that they know about women so much. And the schools and the teachers and the principals, they blame the mother for working. And I have no idea why they are blaming us when uh, the economy itself says that we may need to work to the child to go to that school and pay the uh, fees. And same thing, so we get blame a lot. But that blame, I think that something that we have to carry as and the guiltiness of being employed and still want to be a perfect mother and a perfect wife. 
is more burden than being a successful employee and a career woman. That is a psychological cost that no one can calculate. I think partly that was brought out, that was what was interesting because we actually asked women if you would like to put a monetary cost, how much would you put? Obviously, the sample of women working in our sample was low-income women, right? Their household incomes were around 50,000. Uh, so, so, so obviously, they put the value based on their level of income. But it was very clear the working women had the highest emotional and physical cost because they compared to, because we asked even the non-working women if you were working to put a cost, right? So that was why it was very interesting because these were costs women associated uh, imagining certain instances. So it was, it was very interesting to show that, that definitely working women carried the highest uh, cost, uh, emotional and physical cost, which is confirming uh, what everyone said. So it was, it was very, actually, we also felt that was one of the most interesting things about this study is putting a rupee value uh, to an emotional cost that a person goes through uh, by having to work. And that brings out uh, something that people do not normally associate with or think about uh, when we talk about female labor force participation. I think we are almost up with time. Unless there are, I will give you give one minute to if there are any burning last questions before uh, closing the session. And uh, of course, the panelists are most welcome to say any last thoughts as well, if, if you wish. So it looks like there is none. Thank you so much for participating at this event. And, and we do encourage you to go and uh, read, uh, read our uh, study and also leave your business card with, uh, with our staff out there. So when we do, do research uh, in this topic, just like the care services uh, mapping research that uh, Professor Dilani is doing, we would love to share, the, share our research with you. So do share your contact details, do leave them with us. And thank you very much for joining us. And uh, I'm sure, uh, are there any, Anything else the organizers want to say? Or we can wind up. I would like to really finally thank uh, the panelists. I know all of them are very, very busy individuals. Thank you very much for uh, sparing the time and being with us. And we do hope that uh, we will continue this conversation and also advocate, continue to advocate for policy changes and g get the support from the policymakers to make them get them implemented. Thank you very much. Good evening to all of you.